And that might be an argument for saying that for a lot of these patients, IND alone was probably sufficient and they may not have needed antibiotics anyway. Um, and that's a finding that's been um, substantiated in other studies as well. So I guess that, that article is good, it's comprehensive, but it doesn't really tell us um, about MRSA and skin and soft tissue infections here. Um, resistance has geographic variations um, and bacterial makeup does as well. So I looked at this study as well that was done here and this was just published this past year. So I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard about this study before, so I'm not going to spend too long on it, but um, it was a prospective observational study of a chief complaint of skin or soft tissue infection in three academic emerges in London, and they excluded um, a small number of patients that had uh, abscesses that would be associated with different kinds of bacteria. So they included things, everything from cellulitis to um, abscesses to ulcers. Um, involved 205 patients, and they did two things. So they defined colonization and infection. So colonization was people who had um, nares or throat cultured for MRSA, and then infection was um, infection sites cultured for MRSA. And they found a bunch of um, predictor variables associated with MRSA infection and colonization, which in, there's a bit of overlap there, but in summary, incarceration in the past year, known exposure to MRSA, competitive sports, homelessness, and previous abscess in the past year. Um, were associated with uh, MRSA colonization or infection. Um, they found that MRSA was the only organism <coughs> isolated in 22% of purulent skin and soft tissue infections, um, but overall about 17% of patients were colonized or infected with MRSA. So quite a few. 71% um, of the patients with MRSA had community acquired MRSA, so that means the absence of risk factors for hospital acquired MRSA, so that's a clinical uh, diagnosis and 82% of the MRSA isolates uh, by genotyping were characteristic of community acquired. Um, here, 100% again were susceptible to SEPTRA and VANCO, but only 75% were susceptible to clindamycin. Um, about 70% of patients with MRSA got antibiotics with no MRSA coverage, but as we talked about with the, with the New England Journal of Medicine study, if, those, if they were abscesses that got drained, it might not have made that much of a difference for some of them. Um, so the bottom line, I think, for those two studies is that MRSA is responsible for a lot of purulent skin and soft tissue infections and probably some non-purulent ones as well. Um, but most MRSA skin and soft tissue infections happen in people without any risk factors. So it's a bit hard to decide who warrants MRSA coverage and who doesn't. So I think that the bottom line is that empiric MRSA coverage should be considered in most purulent skin and soft tissue infections. The last question that I had about that particular patient was whether or not we need to use antibiotics for an abscess after IND. And I'm gonna talk about um, a, um, a study that reviewed a bunch of studies and then a study that came out in the same year um, uh, that was not reviewed, included in this study. So, um, so in the Annals of Emergency Medicine, um, they looked at six studies. Um, three were RCTs, um, and of the RCTs, one had no blinding or placebo group. One only involved 50 patients, and one had patients who, as part of their treatment, got Caflex, but 52% of their abscesses grew MRSA, so um, it's a bit of a limitation of their study, I guess. And then three cohort studies, um, and of the three, basically all of them found that there was no difference in resolution after IND for an infection for patients getting antibiotics to which MRSA is resistant versus to which MRSA is susceptible, which would imply that um, it doesn't really matter whether you treat them or not. So in all six studies, there was no difference in resolution for antibiotics versus no antibiotics or antibiotics that weren't effective against your infection after IND. But that doesn't answer a lot of questions. So they didn't tease out who had overlying cellulitis and who didn't. And what if we tried to treat patients with antibiotics MRSA is susceptible to, would that include our success rates? Improve, sorry, our excess success rates. So this study looked at that, um, came out the same year. So it was a retrospective cohort study of community acquired MRSA skin and soft tissue infections done in Arkansas. So they only included patients in their study who cultured positive for MRSA. Um, included everything from culturable cellulitis to abscesses. Excluded anything really minor like impetigo. Um, excluded anything major with an underlying disorder like osteomyelitis. And they defined treatment failure as infection worsening after two days and greater than one of requiring a second IND, hospital admission, 
a new skin and soft tissue infection, or microbiologic failure, which was culture of MRSA from a wound after they completed their antibiotics. Their um, time zero from where their two days started was the time at which the IND was performed for most of them. About 20% of the patients didn't get IND, so that time zero was when their wound was cultured. So, like I said, 80% had an IND. Therapy failed in 5% of the active antibiotic group and 13% of the inactive antibiotic group, which was a significant difference. So active antibiotics were antibiotics um, that had activity against MRSA. So that would suggest that treating MRSA abscesses with antibiotics after IND may prevent treatment failure. But 20% didn't get an IND. So I guess the bottom line is that MRSA abscesses may benefit from antibiotics but there's been no large randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial done, so it's really still up to clinical judgment. Yeah. Heather, that, um, you said there was failure. It looked like that was a composite outcome in uh, four different, it could have been one of the four different That's right. items, and one of those was microbiological failure, yes. which is always very questionable. Mm -hmm. Do you know what percentage of those quote, failures were microbiological failures, which are clinical failures? I don't, and I don't think it said it in the study because I don't recall reading it. So I don't know the answer to that. So the second case that um, I'm going to talk about was a, a healthy 39-year-old male. Um, he presented <coughs> to a community eMERGE complaining of a red and painful left arm for the past three days, so sounds kind of like the last guy. No trauma associated with it. He'd already been on outpatient ceftriaxone for three days in the community. Um, he's febrile, still feels unwell. His erythema is spreading, and this is what it looked like. So you can see the different lines where people have kind of drawn things over the past few days, and it continues to spread beyond borders. And that made me question, um, in this era of community-acquired MRSA, um, do, are we still looking at the same bacteria causing diffuse non-culturable cellulitis? And there's two studies that have come out recently looking at that. Well, a review and a study, I should say. So um, this uh, study looked at the role of beta hemolytic strep in causing diffuse non-culturable cellulitis, and that came out uh, a couple of years ago. So it's a prospective study at a California uh, county hospital. And they had 248 patients with diffuse non-culturable cellulitis. So not associated with some kind of purulent wound that you could culture. Um, they excluded people who had um, perineal, periorbital, or groin locations. Anybody who could have had an opportunistic infection, like people with neutropenia. Um, different bugs involved, so animal or human bites. Um, underlying uh, uh, disorder like osteomyelitis. Um, and they also excluded people that had a soft tissue infection or pharyngitis in the past year because um, the way that they determined who had had beta hemolytic strep was by doing serology, so that would have potentially interfered with that. And the way that they figured out who had which organisms in non-culturable cellulitis was a bit of a roundabout way. So they looked at anti-streptolysin O antibodies and anti-DNAs B antibodies measured at baseline and then 2 to 12 weeks later. So ASO measures, um, um, those antibodies are antibodies to group A strep, group C strep, and group G strep. And ADB uh, are antibodies to group A strep. So they also, um, sorry, I should say that um, typically in infection, um, your uh, titers should rise within about two weeks and then start to decline about three to six months later. So it should be a parent who has an infection because they're it should be a certain amount of rise, and then they should be above the upper limit of normal for adults on their second titer. Um, and only 2 to 5% of normal adults would have titers over the number that they um, had as their upper limit of normal. They also uh, looked at blood cultures as well to kind of capture the people who had group B strep because they weren't using um, antibodies that could look at group B strep. So their secondary outcome was looking at response to beta-lactams, um, and that was analyzed by assessing clinical improvement after greater than 48 hours of treatment. Um, but, uh, sorry, they, so the physicians were asked to use gram-positive beta-lactams, and for the most part, they complied with that. So um, most patients, 83%, were treated with cefazolin. Um, most of the rest were treated with oxacillin. And then a handful of patients got things like Pengee, ceftriaxone, clavulin, um, piptazo. 
Um, so that response to beta-lactams could only be done because they weren't determining who got what treatment. So that response could only be measured in people who were not covered for MRSA. <coughs> so they only measured response to beta-lactams in people who'd gotten one dose or less of MRSA covering antibiotics. So they could get one dose of an MRSA active antibiotic in the emergency department, but that was it. So there was 248 patients enrolled. Um, 69 cases had to be dropped. Um, they couldn't be assessed for repeat serology because they were lost to follow-up. So they might have completed their initial hospital stay of 48 hours or whatever, so they could be assessed for a beta-lactam response, but because they never showed up to get their repeat serology done, we don't know what they were infected with. Um, so 179 people had a complete evaluation, and 131 of those were positive for beta-hemolytic strep. So everybody was assessed for a beta-lactam response, but they had to drop a significant number of people who were unevaluable because um, they got less than 48 hours of treatment, i.e. they left AMA or were discharged early, um, mm -hmm. or they got more than one dose of an antibiotic with MRSA. So you can see that the people who actually um, were assessed for beta-lactam response, largely it was successful. So there were very few treatment failures, even in the group that wasn't positive for beta-hemolytic strep but there were a lot of unevaluable patients. So at the end, 73% um, of patients had a beta-hemolytic strep infection. 96% responded to beta-lactams successfully, um, and that includes the group of beta-hemolytic strep negative patients. There's obviously some issues um, with interpretation of this study. So positive serology doesn't include co-infections, so some of these Infections could have been um, polymicrobial. There was a very large unevaluable group of patients. And I don't know, Dr. John can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that serology doesn't, that serology doesn't necessarily mean the infection itself was caused by beta-hemolytic strep. Maybe it was caused by something else that just provided a portal of entry in the skin for beta-hemolytic strep. Maybe that wasn't the original pathogen. Um, so even in the era of community-acquired MRSA, beta-hemolytic strep may be still the most common cause of diffuse non-culturable cellulitis. So this is a study that came out the same year with kind of a conflicting point of view. And um, this was a systematic review of the etiology of cellulitis with intact skin, so kind of a similar group of people. Um, and they looked at studies that had used needle aspiration or punch biopsy to try to culture um, people's cellulitis where there wasn't anything that was culturable. So they, again, excluded similar people, so ocular odontogenic um, infections, anything deep tissue or involving another organ, which they defined as an abscess or osteomyelitis. Any things that were thought to be contaminants, like staph epidermis, were excluded. Um, and anything involving a skin break was excluded as well. So in the end, they were left with 808 patients in total from 16 articles. 127 had positive cultures, 65 of which grew Staph aureus, 35 grew group A strep. A very small number grew other beta hemolytic strep. So the most common etiology of cellulitis in this study was actually Staph aureus. However, most cultures yielded no organism, so the vast majority yielded no organism. So maybe the real culprit is just more difficult to obtain or culture. Some of the studies were older, so we can't really make any comments about the proportion of them that were MRSA because it was before that proportion would have been higher. Um, so I think that the bottom line is that even in this era of community-acquired MRSA, probably most non-culturable cellulitis is still caused by MSSA and group A strep. So it, what they suggest in that, those articles is to start with a beta-lactam and then broaden coverage if treatment failure at two days. Um, and patients, ba patients allergic to beta-lactams could maybe just start with um, clindamycin, since that has um, some MRSA coverage. I guess another approach is to treat people with risk factors or those more likely to fail treatment. You could broaden their coverage empirically. So um, I think most of us were at research day when Danny was talking about uh, uh, his research about uh, factors independently associated with treatment failure, which included uh, fever at 